Anybody heard of that? Foundations for Living? It's a discipleship track, and they train using that material. And uh, they've been in Iraq, they've been in Cuba, and they're heading to Thailand. And is it Chiang Mai? May you'll be for about a month in Thailand. And um, so Tina and Eva Buznitz are sisters. Uh, Tina already gone on before the Lord, so she's already worked praying for you all in your ministry. Let's just, as we start this morning, let's just pray over Susan and uh, Dick. Lord, we pray your anointing will continue to burn upon them and within them and through them. That as they move next to Chiang Mai to, to build into and to invest uh, into those there in the church, in Chiang Mai, that, Lord, they will, they will be guided every single step of the way by the lamp that is your word unto their feet and by the light of your spirit unto their path. And, Lord, that those believers there that are being equipped and trained, likewise, have your anointing upon them to bring the good news to many, 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 many others that you are going to reach through them. And that the blessing will flow through that work, Lord, unto a thousand generations until you come. We pray for, for Dick and Susan and their ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dick. And Dick just says thank you to everybody. That One of the memorials at Tina's funeral was for this ministry, and it was a great amount of money that has allowed this work to continue. Let's give the Lord a clap of praise. Well, thank you. I'm going to try something new. I have a clicker. And I'm not afraid to use it. So I don't see anything on the screen yet, but I know when we get there shortly that I'll follow along in the general direction of the, of the notes that are on the, the back side of the uh, announcements there. And brave new world for me. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Well, I know for me as we study the Beatitudes here, this is one of the cornerstones of my life. And uh, it's always a joy for me to have the opportunity to share uh, any teaching on the Beatitudes anywhere, anytime. So we're going to begin a series now, I don't know, eight weeks, nine weeks, we'll see. I can probably bunch a couple together, uh, maybe one and two we'll bunch together next week, we'll see how it goes in the preparation. But um, we're going to begin the Beatitudes, and I'm going to use this morning as an introduction um, and I know for, in my life, I've often wondered what the best version of my life would be. You know, am I living the best version of my life? Am I living out of the, the fruit that he's growing in, uh, on the vine in my life? Am I, am I resting in him? Am I abiding in my life? And I'm often, 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 and I have for years, and some of you are, are too, right? You've, for years, you've been asking that question. Am I really in a place in my life where I'm living out the best version of my life? It's the, what would Jesus do in this situation if he were me? in this right now. Not what Jesus do, you know, with Jesus, separate, sinless, but what would Jesus do if he were me? Sinful and broken. I know you've wondered this, right? Huh? You've wondered this. 
And I can't think of a better question to ask throughout any given moment of any given situation. I can't think of a better question to ask. What is the best version of me? What would Jesus be doing right here? And you know, the realization that comes to me is that's exactly what he wants to do right here through me. He's anticipating that I'm open, that I'm in the potter's hands, that I'll be clay that's soft and moldable and can be directed as he leads. What is the best version of ourselves? And and for me, the Beatitudes are a description of what the truly best version, the truly good life is, and thereby the greatest blessings flow from. What is prosperous? When I say the word prosperous, do you think that that person's prosperous or I'm, the Lord has prospered me? Do you think finances? I've been prospered financially, right? A lot of us would think of finances when we think of prosperous. That's a very prosperous family, right? Well, that's just one dimension of prosperous. We could be prosperous in so many other ways and not be prosperous in that area. Is that true? Amen? There's so many ways to be prosperous, many of which we just sung about in our songs this morning. A very prosperous life, a truly blessed life, a truly good life is what the Beatitudes are describing and what they are trying to lead you and I towards. They're a description of what it looks like to be good, to be blessed from the perspective of God, not from the perspective of this world. Now, these teachings, what interests me about these teachings is I, I am my, one of my big hobbies is I study American history and I study church history, and I love uh, to also study world religions. And I get the opportunity to teach on world religions sometimes, too, in my rotation at Hutch Community College. I wish I could teach it five times every semester. Um, And I love going to countries and learning about people's faith through other religions. And One thing that has amazed me is that as I meet people and as I study and as I read uh, uh, even more people who understand their faith in a totally different religion, I am always impressed with how many people know the blessed R's of Jesus. Blessed are they who, they know the Beatitudes. They can recognize some of them. I know a Buddhist woman in Sri Lanka who has the Beatitudes in her heart. Across world religions, many of the greatest teachers of all time have written about these teachings of Jesus as among, if not the most sublime teachings ever uttered by a human voice. Wow. Wow. People from other faiths all over the planet through different ages are broadly accepting these teachings. So as we begin exploring what Jesus says, the truly good, truly blessed, truly happy, truly prosperous, best version of myself and yourself is, let me just offer you two warnings straight up front. I get my first use of the clicker here. These teachings are only
for those who want their life built for eternity. If our priority is to build our lives for this world, these teachings don't make a lick of sense. They're confusing. They're upsetting. They're disappointing. They're not what we want. They're of no use. And that's right. Because these teachings are built for people who are wanting God to shape their lives for ever. For ever. So that's the first warning. It's not for us to judge the Beatitudes on a timeline of our individual lives. Because in eternity, the timeline is shattered. It's not for us to judge the Beatitudes or God's best for our lives on a timeline. It may look ugly here and turn out absolutely gorgeous there. And vice versa. It's not for us to judge the Beatitudes or to even look for God to try to shape us from three-dimension perspective. That everything happens in just three dimensions and on a timeline. Because in heaven and in eternity, all these dimensions are shattered. The timeline is shattered. We're way beyond that because we're worth God in heaven. And he's not limited by three dimensions. Make it. Ten. And I can tell you, I can, I can describe what one dimension is, two dimension is, three dimensions is, what it would be like to live in one, two, and three dimensions, because well, we live in three dimensions. But I find it very difficult to go to the fourth. Okay, it's a stretch. To the fifth, that's a stretch. If you ever want a mind bender, try imagining what life would be like past three dimensions. And God is there beyond those limitations and beyond time. So when he's trying to shape our lives here, he's not just shaping us here. This is like a sandbox. This is a little little kid playground. This is preparation for there. And we're here to get ready to be part of there. Amen? Amen? The Beatitudes for lives that are built for eternity. And without this perspective, it's not going to make any sense. And second warning is Jesus' aim is not for us to have pretty pictures of the Beatitudes on the wall. The Beatitudes are not for us to have poetry stitched, you know, or little cards for special occasions the, the Beatitudes are not for us to memorize and just leave there. Yeah, I got to memorize, or I got most of them, I understand, I, I recognize them in the Bible, or I know where they are. They're not to impart information, but to cause a transformation. You know, transformation, that's like a worm becoming a butterfly caterpillar becomes a butterfly. That's what this word transformation means. Transformation is like, you know, a squiggly little tadpole in the water sprouting legs and jumping out of the water. That's transformation. And Jesus' aim is transformation in our relationship with God, in our relationship with each other. In fact, maybe sometimes seriously neglected our relationship with ourselves. How we preach the gospel and what gospel we preach when we preach to ourselves every day. How we live it out with each other. He's looking for a transformation in our souls, in our heart, in our soul, in our mind, and through our strength. Transformation of our thoughts, of our desires, of our motivations. 
That's deep stuff. And it takes a lifetime. And we're still not finished. So, warning number one, warning number two. This is for eternity, and the goal is transformation. And to live them is to be centered like Jesus in God. And it's to be God's best for us in this situation, in this time. So before we take a dink, a, a dink drink, a deep drink, that's better than a dink drink, from the Beatitudes, let's just give a little context here and, and start with why we call them Beatitudes. There's a cute little book you can find. It's called The B Attitudes. B E Attitudes. You know, my attitude about things. That's kind of catchy. But why do we call them B Attitudes? What is that word? Where does it come from? Do we ever use it in any other context? No. But we use the word blessed all the time, right? Blessed. Well, that blessed, you know, sometimes we say our, our version of. Well, bless her heart is what a dumb idea. That, you know, you know, you know you're kind of, we're kind of saying, well, bless her heart, you know. We use blessed a lot, though, right? Lord, you, that person's such a blessing in my life. Oh, Lord, thou it's a blessing. We pray for blessing, right? But we don't say beatitudes. Well, the reason we have beatitudes is because for 1,000 years, the Latin language was the only language the Bible was written in. So they went from the Greek and the Hebrew to the Latin, and so for 1,000 years, that's the only Bible the church had, was the Latin. Well, the, the Latin word for blessing is beatitude. So a lot of this stuff has stuck. It's, it's interesting. The word sacrament is Latin. That's stuck. Salvation is Latin. That stuck. Grace. See, there's others like that. So the Greek word is makairos. And I'm not sure I have that trans, uh, pronounced absolutely perfect because in seminary I was busy doing pastoral care and counseling and I was not, I was neglecting Greek and Hebrew. So makarios is translated beatitude in Latin. And it means happy, but it's not like, yeah, you know, thank you. I, that, I'm really happy, you know, I, because this good thing happened to me. It's, it's a happiness that comes because God is blessing. So it could be, I'm really happy in a really sad situation because God is blessing. He is with me. I feel his presence. I know his purpose. I'm in a bad situation that's not happy according to the world, but I'm extremely blessed. I'm joyful, if you will. I'm happy. So it's happy. Or it's blessed. But again, it's not just, I'm blessed. My company blessed me. My, you know, it's blessed by God. So it's something that comes from God. Happiness from God, blessing by God, prosperity from God. Because we can be busy working to get our own, our own way. This is the stuff that comes God's way, Yahweh. All right, so it comes down to being extremely, you can put that extremely happy or extremely blessed or extremely prosperous or fortunate, incredibly well off, abundantly Abundantly blessed. Because one is favored by God. So you get the picture here that God is going to add his favor, increase his strength and power on, on us when we are in his will. His prayers will be answered when they are in his name. Not when we pray what we want and say at the end of the prayer, in your name but when they are in his name. 
right? When we are in his will, these kinds of things. So the Beatitudes describe a life that's in his will, in his purpose, in his character, all of that. And it's because when we are in that, he can increase the blessing through us because it's him who is being increased, not us. It's him who is being increased. The Beatitudes introduced the ministry of the 12 disciples right after they were chosen to follow Jesus. That's impressive to me. When Jesus chose the 12 disciples for the first time, turn to Luke chapter 6 if you have your Bibles. Luke chapter 6. Let's look at, at that section there. Verse 17 through 26, before 17, is very interesting, too, in this whole context. This area, Luke chapter 6, records that that, um, Jesus chose the disciples, and the first thing he does is he, he, he teaches them from the Beatitudes. That's pretty interesting to me, that Jesus chose... This truth, this way of sharing truth with his disciples when they were first called. We're going to dig into that a little bit more. Now keep your finger in Luke 6 and go back to Matthew chapter 5. Now this is after he's, Jesus has already chosen the disciples. Not long after as far as we can tell, but it's, it's after. It's later in the sequence. And in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12, which is where we're going to anchor this series, most, this is the Beatitudes, this is what we know as the Beatitudes, okay? Jesus uses this expanded version of the Beatitudes for this huge crowd. As he begins this massive sermon, we're, we know as the Sermon on the Mount, that is also b- From the Beatitudes to the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount is also the most globally in other world religions recognized teaching of Jesus. This is the big stuff, okay, that's recognized globally. And in Matthew, we have him using the Beatitudes expanded, no no cliff notes, no like, I know, you know, you've already heard some of this type version, expanded version, before Jesus goes into the full Sermon on the Mount. This is the introduction. So you've got your fingers in both places. We're going we're gonna to come back here shortly. Don't lose them. So in Luke 6, we have a condensed version of the Beatitudes. And in this version, Jesus shares the first, the second, the fourth, and the eighth with the disciples. When he turns to them, he shares those four. The first, the second, the fourth, and the eight Beatitudes, which are also listed in your notes. You can refer to them there. It's a, it's a condensed version. But then he also gives not just the four blessings, he gives four warnings. But woe to you, he says. He so, so he's saying, but blessed are you, and then he turns on, but woe are you. That's what he gives the disciples. Blessed are you if... But woe do you if, okay? He saves his woes to, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. But when he shares the Beatitudes in Matthew to that, that big group, he's not just addressing the disciples. But what he's sharing here is the good news. This is the good news. You read what happens because we are blessed or living our blessed version of ourselves, what is happening is the good news. The kingdom of heaven, that's the good news, right? That that we can be home forever with God and one another is huge. That's the good news, and it's amazing news, the amazing news that Jesus brings. That the kingdom of God is right here, it is at hand, and we can step in into it. We can live into it. Jesus, it's not like this future thing, right? It's at hand. It's as close as our breath. We can step into it. Woof!
That's good news. And Jesus uses these Beatitudes in two different times to two different groups of people. And he may have done this many, many other times. We only have these two different times recorded. But he could have used the Beatitudes over and over again. It could have been a standard teaching of the disciples when they were with Jesus and they clustered out into smaller groups. They could have used it. We don't know. My guess is they used it a lot. They used this teaching a lot. He may have, have uh, used it and unpacked it in different ways like he does in these two examples. But what we do see and what we do know is we see Jesus using them twice for different groups at different times. And this underscores for me their huge importance. When you first call your disciples and when you begin the massive culminating teaching of your life, that says a lot to me, that the Beatitudes show up as the introduction to both. Now let's go back and take a closer look. Luke, a closer look. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. So Jesus is first choosing the twelve. It is at this time that he went off, Jesus went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when the day came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also named as apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Verse 17, Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place, and there was a large crowd of his disciples. So he came down with the 12, and there's a larger group that the 12 were chosen from. And a great throng of people also were there from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, 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 who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. All the people were trying to touch him you can imagine the mayhem, people, spirits getting cast out, people being healed. And all the people were trying to touch him, for power was coming from him and healing them all. And turning his gaze toward his disciples. So he's coming down, he's chosen his disciples, he's coming down and there's this massive group. And they're all gathering around him, and the power is of God, the power of the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven is being displayed. Healings, illnesses are being removed, demons are being removed, people's lives are being transformed. It's like they're in the kingdom. Right now they're getting a glimpse of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And it's this maze, and Jesus turns to his disciples, and he says these beatitudes the first, the second, the fourth, and the eighth. Which again tells me the first and second, the fourth and the eighth must have a special place because they're also included in the all eight. And turning his gaze towards his disciples, verse 20, he began to say, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. All right, we'll pick up on this as we unpack it more and more. And turning his gaze toward his disciples, he began to say, to who? To his disciples. Blessed are you who hunger now. Blessed are, first, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now. That's the fourth in the Matthew instance who hunger now, for your, you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, that's the second in the Matthew instance, you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, that's the eighth in the Matthew, Matthew instance. Blessed are men who hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in the day and leap for joy 
and behold. What's happening all around him? People are leaping for joy all around him. He's saying, be glad and leap for joy. And you, you just and everywhere there's a sermon illustration for this sermon. That is, he's turned and leap for joy. And behold, your reward is great in heaven. And this is just a taste of the reward in heaven. When tear ducts are removed, when illness is removed, when new bodies are given in a new heaven and a new earth, this is just a taste. And he says, bless you. Whew, wow, this is good stuff, right? It's, it's, it's going to leap for joy. Your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, their fathers used to treat and profit the prophets. Woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. And he's looking at the disciples. He's not going, you, everybody out there. He's looking at the disciples. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the prophets in the same way. See, in Matthew, this much larger group then, where he's not just looking at the disciples and he's beginning his Sermon on the Mount, right? We, We can actually see the Beatitudes. I'm making the point, and I'm not alone, that, um, The Beatitudes can be seen as an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount and a summary, a Cliff Notes summary of the entire sermon. It's kind of like, take all that, put it into this, you can remember this. You can teach this, take all that, put it into this, live it out, good for you. Focus on that. That's the way I approach it. So, here on, the, here on the mount, Jesus is reaching out in Matthew. We're going to switch over to Matthew now, Matthew 5. Jesus is reaching out to this huge crowd that was following him, and he's speaking to them. The disciples are there, but he's not focusing this teaching on them alone. And he's beginning to describe in depth what human life and community look like, what human life and human community feel like under the rule of God and not under the rule of man. And how opposite that community and how opposite those relationships are to the world's way. It's like it's all upside down. It's the upside down kingdom. It's not the world's kingdom. And here on the mount, Jesus reaching out to this group and he's telling them about the kingdom of God and it is the good news. And he's teaching the way of the kingdom of God. He unpacks it more. He adds the other four beatitudes in for this group. It's it's the summary. It's the big picture. It's the Cliff Notes version. So let's take a look. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And I'm reading from the New American Standard. I just love if you have a different version, you can hear the words differently and get some richness and some nuances out of it but I'll be reading from the New American. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened, which is a large group, he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now it's not just blessed are the poor in the Cliff Notes version, it's the expanded version. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you 
Verse 11 and 12 are expansions of the eighth beatitude. We don't, I don't look at these as 9 and 10. I, I consider them expansions of the eighth. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we see eight Beatitudes, and this is where we're going to anchor this series, is in these eight. The fuller of the two sets. It's a perfectly worded set of teachings. It has the least number of possible words to to encompass the greatest amount of truth possible. You can't have less words and capture this truth. It's almost like any more words would ruin it. It's this beautiful, God-inspired, God-teaching. And we see these eight perfectly worded. They're poetic, especially in the original language. And it's my opinion, and that's my argument that I'm making, and you come to your own conclusions, that Jesus probably used this over and over again. But the disciples, as they wrote the scriptures, were saying once is enough. You know, we're, we're not going over all these details. We've we got to cover other stuff, too. But I think this is crucial to the core teaching. That's just the way I see it. And I also make the case that this is not just an introduction. It is an introduction. It's not just an introduction. It's also a summary, okay, of all of Jesus' teaching that everyone can enter the kingdom of heaven and indeed all must enter through the same door and travel the same path. See, it's easy to look for all the right things in the wrong places. We could actually be motivated to look for the right things, but if we're looking in the wrong places, we can be deceived with the counterfeits, right? Say, oh, this must be the right thing because we don't see the real thing. The kingdom of heaven is totally at odds with the world. And if we're looking to the world, we're looking in the wrong place for the right things. It's the upside-down kingdom. It's in the world, but not of the world. And as we continue to give the Beatitudes their context, take a closer look. Notice the promise in Matthew 5, verse 3 of the first Beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is, not will be, is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now go to verse 10, the eighth beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you see the result in both is the same? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, okay? So the first and the last of this set of eights both lead to the same result. What is it? The kingdom of heaven. Anybody interested? Anybody interested? Yeah! I'm interested. The first and the last Beatitudes have this same identical promise in the same exact wording. That's impressive to me. And it's as if they're doorways to experiencing that life that the kingdom of heaven brings. These are the doorways. That's the way I look at them. It's like, okay, here's the beginning. You want to go through? Here's the doorway. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's not just what, it's how when I read these. And then what's the last doorway? We don't want, we don't like this one. Persecuted. But it's like Stephen being murdered with stones 
And what doorway was opened up to him when he saw the angels? The kingdom of heaven. Also, the first and the last are external circumstances. Now, being poor in spirit is personal, it's internal, but because we are born in original sin, by stuff we didn't do, but our parents, 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 go all the way back to Adam and Eve did, and we're born in a sin lineage because sin entered the world, and it is just as much of our DNA as anything else. Sin entered us Right? Original sin, as Paul would call it. So, because we are in original sin, we are by nature fallen and in need of a Savior from the very beginning of our lives. Our condition is, if we want to admit it straight up, poor. Poverty, broken. That's our condition from the get-go. So I, I say the first as well as the last are conditions. They are situations, they are circumstances that we don't choose. We only have control over our reactions to them. The first and the last are the two doorways to the kingdom as well. The kingdom of heaven. But the other six sandwiched in between have things to do with us, our choices, and how we react, how we are led by our choices. So, being poor in spirit is a real fact. It's imposed on us by external circumstances. Being persecuted for righteousness' sake, we don't ask for it, at least not usually, but it's imposed on us from external circumstances. Now look at the six sandwiched in between these two that I look at as doorways. Verse 4, okay, is the second beatitude. We just had blessed are the poor in spirit, now we have blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. We choose to mourn. Or not to. We'll talk more about that next week. Blessed are they, they, those who, what is it, gentle is a word, or blessed are the meek, right? For they will inherit the earth. Verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Verse 7, blessed are they, those who are merciful. They will receive mercy. Verse 8, the sixth beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Anybody want to go down that path? See God? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Anybody want to be called sons of God? Anybody want to receive mercy? Anybody want to have the deepest satisfaction any human being can have? Anybody interested in being comforted? See? Are you in? I'm all in. And then we get to the last beatitude. So as we go through these six in the middle, and we'll unpack each one week by week. Maybe we'll cluster a few together. I don't know yet. But we have the first and the last the same blessing, the six in the middle with different blessings, okay? But then within that six, I, I agree with those who see two groups. The first group of three and the second group of three, all right? The first group of three is those specific choices we have to make in that transformation journey. We've got to make these choices for to go from a, a tadpole to a frog, or an even more beautiful picture, is from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Beatitude 2, verse 4. 
Blessed are those who mourn. Okay. It's the choices we make when we're mourning that open or close the door for our comfort. Blessed are those who are meek. It's the choices we make when we are, are meek. It's a choice we make to be meek, to be humble, to submit, right? To put ourselves at the end of the table, to not be pushy, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Isn't that up to us? It's up to us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We choose to mourn or not mourn. We choose how we will mourn. We choose to be humble or meek. I'll unpack that a lot more later. We choose to be hungry. What we're hungry for. What are we hungry for? What are we thirsty for? And here, it's for righteousness. And if we make that choice, the blessing is we will be satisfied in ways that food and drink could never, ever satisfy us. So we must choose to mourn our condition over the poverty of spirit, for example. We must choose the constraint of meekness and humility. We must truly choose to hunger and thirst for things that are of righteous, that are things of God, all of which can be seen as doing what Jesus would do if he was you or me in that situation. Be the best version of ourselves. Then he summarizes in the next three how the fruit, the the fruit comes and what that fruit is from that kind of transforming relationship with God. That's the way I look at it. Look at it. I'm just sharing it with you. Blessed are the merciful, Beatitude 5. We become people of mercy. We become that. It's just who we become. People who give mercy to others because we recognize the mercy we have first been given. Blessed are the pure in heart. Our hearts are not distracted by God and by the pools of the pools of the world. Blessed are the peacemakers. We become makers of peace in our relationships with with God, in our relationships with each other, in our relationship with ourselves. Finally, we can look at the eight Beatitudes as steps. As steps or processes in the spiritual life. Step one, step two, step three. I'm going to unpack them that way as I unpack this series. I'm, for me, they're powerful. For me, they're deeply profound. And they come from Jesus as he proclaims the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven as Matthew says it. These are the steps to entering into such a blessed life that we actually can look at our lives and say, I'm in the place I need to be. (sighs) I'm doing what I'm called to do. (sighs) And it's his power, not mine that is accomplishing this work. (sighs) Finally, and this is where the Beatitudes are leading us. This is how I will approach this series so that all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength can be conformed to him. I'm excited. How about you? And if you know somebody who's missed today and you say, you ought to come next week. You want somebody you can think of that you want to invite or several somebodies that you would like to invite next week as we kick off this series. All right? Please invite them. We're just beginning the series. There's no better time to make an invitation, right? At the beginning of something. So people don't feel like they're missing out. And if you would like and you get a a copy of the, the CD from Faith or however you would feel most led to be effective in doing this, share it with them as an introduction. Say, this is what we're going to be doing. I know he's crazy, he's goofy, he says things in weird ways, but I think it could still be really powerful. All right? Because God may use him in spite of himself, right? Okay. So, are we praying for God to use us? Are we praying for God to use 
us together as a congregation, as a family? And are we praying for it to be God's power and not our own? All right, let's pray. Lord, we are praying for your power, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And we are praying, Lord, that it's not our own might and our own power. No, no, no. That it's not our own wisdom and our own intelligence. Oh, for, for heaven's sake, no. That it is your wisdom, your discernment, in and through us together, in our families, individually, with you in our families, and together as your family. And so, Lord, with this song, we use this song as a prayer. We open our hearts and minds in faith to you now and forever. Amen? Amen.